Fridays. Two Fridays. Two Fridays ago, we actually were able to do a presentation at the church in Rio Negro that we have affiliated ourselves with. Um, and we sort of double teamed. I did a presentation on encountering the good God. And when I finished, James actually led them into an encounter. And at the so, end, about six people got up and shared their experience of what they encountered while they were uh, being led through this with James. And it was it was just wonderful. It was a good turnout. Uh, the people really appreciated and you know had an experience. And uh, it was really wonderful. And of course, a lot of what we presented uh, and in the way we presented it, you know, some of the things that we learned from you and uh, these people have really embraced us and are supporting, <clears throat> excuse me, supportive of our mission in Choco. And so on October 1st, we have been blessed by God to move into a house in Rio Negro. So that 45 minute commute is gone. Good. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's great when when you you can share whatever you want with people, but if they can't connect to it and experience it, it's just information sure. and it's great as you know, activate it for people, engage it. Then then people have the sort of the wow, what was that or where does that lead or, you know, it all opens things up once people have had an experience and you can talk to people about engaging heaven or engaging the good God. But they they probably have so much religious programming, particularly in a, in a in a Catholic sort of area and things, and it, to, to what that really means, you know, and you know, unless you experience the good God in some way, and He engages you and reveals that goodness, you're still going to struggle. I mean, how many how many people? who are even engaging some things still struggle with the who God really is, you know, and they still have this view of God as being angry and distant and whatever, even though we're trying to engage him, their mindsets are still stuck in that. Yeah. Yes. And a lot of people are like that, you know, they, they get stuck, you know, in that programming and it's not easy to get out of without actually encountering it. You can't convince someone out of it. You know that they that they are in the belief system. You've got to help them come out of that belief system by experiencing something different. You know, and that's great that you know you can do activations and encourage people to experience, you know, the goodness of God because we're all starts, isn't it? You know, it's that it's no God is good. He loves us all the time, and he wants us to come deeper into that. Yeah, you know, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was great. <clears throat> All right. Well, anything they want to talk about, or well, what about joy in heaven? Uh, one of the things that I read uh, years ago was a book by the name of uh, by uh, Rebecca Springer, and within Heaven's Gates, in that book, I, I'm sure you've read it. In that book, uh, one of the characters is having a challenge, experiencing the joy coming out of depression from his life activities while living mm. and it deals with the efforts of the people around him to uh, help him along to prayer and encouragement but I was sort of surprised as I thought about sort of things we discussed that that would even be a challenge in that place or at least this is the way it was explained by Rebecca yeah um I, th I think there's there's quite a lot which I think is surrounded about the realms of heaven and how much heaven is related to the earth experiences and how much is not. Uh, and I know some people say, well, when you step into heaven, you don't carry anything with you. I mean, that isn't true. Okay. You know, you, you, you're, if you're going in, in your spirit, that might be true. But if you're going in, in your soul, it's definitely not true because your soul doesn't suspend all its, but that's why you go in there and get, changed and transformed by the experiences of being in there you know and i think just because you step into something doesn't mean you leave everything behind or it no longer is a thing but you have the opportunity of engaging it at a different perspective in a different way um, and i think you know there's there's a lot of stuff going on at the minute with people looking at some of the weird experiences that people say they have in heaven or 
you know and some you know some of the fanciful stuff and the pizza parlor stuff and the playground and fun fair stuff that people are saying is in heaven and it's like well i've never seen it and a lot of other people have never seen it so what is it mm -hmm. is it a projection of people's soul's desire for something that they want or is it real is it real you know and therefore are people's experiences actual reality or are they having an experience which is filtered through the projection of their soul same thing applies when someone says well i can't open my first love gate well it's in your spirit your spirit is inaccessible to the enemy so why can't you open it because the soul's projecting over it people see you know it blocked locked barred you know experiences because of their their soul is damaged by first love experiences they don't trust people so they protect themselves by projecting you can't open this if you open this we're going to be in danger so i'm projecting my soul's projecting over my spirit so that the filters come now the reality is it's our first love gate jesus wouldn't say i stand at the door and knock if we couldn't open it you know but it, it the illusion of not opening it is because the soul has the power to project and i do believe that some of the experiences that some people talk about in heaven you know someone was talking to me once about you know a baseball diamond that they were engaging in heaven you know mm -hmm. and i'm like not really sure that i'd ever seen one of them and would why would there be one but it was something that related to something that helped her now was it actually a act real place that anyone else can go to or was it something that was symbolic that she needed to engage and and her imagination was used in creating that for her to get some perspective on something so there are engaging heaven and there are having visions of things which have particular symbolic meaning and they're not necessarily the same thing you know you can see something in a vision which is not the same as being there and by doing that you essentially have uh, you know potentially you have ways of how how do you understand whether something's real or whether your experience of it is designed for you and what's reality mm -hmm. you know you know we, we have a lot of choices on well what's reality what's reality look like what's my reality well i see things through the reality of my own mind which is yes. going to potentially have different perspectives than the reality of your mind you know and um, so you know i might look at god and and engage him in a particular way you might look at god and engage him in another way now all that's valid as long as we don't project it as this is the ultimate this is the reality and this is the only way that's when it becomes a problem you know because then you are then being prescriptive about what someone else is seeing and and must see rather than how god might lead them things and what obviously you don't want to do is to be saying well heaven's like a fun fair because it isn't it's a governmental place you know a relational place of but it's not like a fun fair but you may have a vision of a fun fair that relates to something in your life perhaps or even a projection of your soul's desire to have fun and not do anything else doesn't make it a good place necessarily if, if you're creating it as a fantasy to avoid reality mm -hmm. and that's where the soul can project a fantasy to keep us that's why people get dissociative disorder and compartmentalize and don't deal with things because they can create a reality in which i don't have to deal with this mm. and i think you know from what i can understand recently some people are challenging that view now we've got to be careful we don't challenge that view in a judgmental way you know, otherwise you know all you do is create more division and more issues rather than okay that isn't my experience of heaven if it's yours then what what purpose is that you know and in the realm of the kingdom of god of course you do have at the enemy has access to the accusations court and we have dragons and giants and things there which are spiritual forces 
which are looking to usurp authority. Now, you could have an illusion, a fant fantasy type vision of something to escape reality. You know, our, our, our soul is capable of creating fantasy environments to create reality. And that can be one that cre creates a reality which avoids coming into responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a complex issue, yeah. which is not, you can't simplify it because everyone's situation is their own. You know, I think if someone's coming out saying heaven's like a big fun fair and we can all just go on rides all day and do nothing, I think that's misrepresenting what heaven's like. Mm -hmm. It may be a projection of someone's own soul, but it really isn't what heaven's like. You know, heaven mm -hmm. is definitely a relational place, but it's also a place of responsibility in sonship. And it's OK yeah. for kids to spend a few hours and hours on fun fairs and fun rides for, but when an adult you wouldn't want to be doing the same thing wow. it would probably be seen as well what are you doing with your life you know <laughs> what you're doing is riding around on rides all day every day you know well you know there's, there's more to life than that as we know but some people you know we have to we have to be aware that when we listen to people's testimonies or experiences we should not be judgmental, but we shouldn't be taken in either and assume that that is a genuine experience of what is the reality rather than their reality. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you can go into the realms of heaven and there is a tabernacle in heaven. Mm -hmm. There is a judgment seat in heaven. There is an ark. There is a throne of grace. There is a tree of life. There are things. There is the river of life. They are realities yeah. which we can engage and experience perhaps differently, but there are definite realities of places you can go. Anyone can go there because they are re real. They're real, you know, but some of those things I don't think are realities, but they still be, can be someone's genuine experience as part of their journey, perhaps. Uh, but it's definitely not a reality. Is it, po is it possible, you know, talking about stuff like that is that, to me, everything that we have here on earth now, I mean, I love roller coasters and the higher, the faster, the crazier they are, yeah. the, the better I like it. <laughs> but to me, the whole concept of being able to do that to me is like, I think that's an idea that came out of heaven. <laughs> in terms right. of, you know, in terms of the creativity, the, the, the engineering, oh, yeah. the mathematics that it takes. Yeah. That was something that came out of heaven. So to me to say that there's a roller coaster in heaven, to me it's the concept was there. It hmm. came from there to here. So the raw, you could experience, to me it's like, yeah, you could walk in and say, okay, this is where the idea came from. Because to me, that came out of heaven or, or some of the technology we have. I wouldn't be surprised that, that at some point I could walk into heaven and say, here's where it started. It was hmm. already here it yeah. came down so i mean sometimes when people talk about that to me it's like the creativity that someone has created they just didn't come up with it. yeah they came up with it in their mind but the kernel of it came from came from god and so we could go back potentially and see this is where this is where the idea really came from yeah yeah there's the discovery house and there are things in there which you know i've i've engaged people with you know i had two or three encounters recently where I went into the discovery house, found a, found a scheme, a diagram, a plan of something, schematic diagram, um, and took it and deposited it into someone's mind in the past. Yeah. Because they were seeking for revelation. That revelation in invention was a discovery and it came out of heaven and was dropped into their mind their mind didn't actually f create it. It was an right. idea which was given to them. Then they developed it because it came out of heaven. Yeah. You know, and I, and I, I did that about three times uh, over a period. And I thought, wow, what are you, what are you trying to show me here? <laughs> is, um, you know, it was just like, okay, this is how things come out of heaven and, and are creative. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Our role to play in it. Okay, mm -hmm. well, it seems that, you know, if you're helping someone engage something why not 
an idea or an invention or or something it talks about witty inventions in the in the bible and stuff doesn't it yeah. so it's just like okay i just didn't see our role for it but if we're available how do those things we know angels take messages to people yeah. we know people get things in dreams sure. well yeah. who who creates those dreams that they get them in because they couldn't have created it out of their own mind because you can only really dream about that which you are, or, which you know no. you know it may be creative in uh, in a weird way but it's still all stuff that you've already had an experience of very rarely i think do people have dreams about things that they don't have a grid for but mm -hmm. perhaps some dreams can be created i know there are dream writers and dream script writers in the realms of heaven who are writing dreams for people to engage with god in those dreams that would so, be a fun job yeah but but there are people doing it some of the scribes are doing it some of the, some you know I, i've heard i've seen people that that is a role that god wants to speak to somebody so they get to write the script for a dream and then see that imparted into someone's dreams you know why not you know someone where does a dream come from that comes from god how does it get into someone's head mm -hmm. You know, how, how does God put a dream into someone or enable someone to have a dream that's revelatory or mm -hmm. symbolic of something that he's wanting to do in their lives or reveal to them about their lives? It's got to get there somewhere. You know, we know angels can come into people's dreams because that happens in the Bible. You know, we know Joseph had a dream and was told not to go to Egypt or told to go to Egypt and then come out of Egypt. And so where did, where did the, where did, how did it get into his dream? Yeah. Well, for me, there was a thing where people can drop it in there. You know, I, yeah, I mean, I did it with two inventions um, and I did it with a group in Africa who needed to discover, I gave them a map to discover a water source. Okay. And and along with the map was the idea of irrigation. Yes. And I sort of, I called the elder. I mean, this this wasn't just a dropping into someone's dream or imagination. This was actually going there and calling the elders to come and meet. It was quite a Whoa. quite an encounter, and it was just like. But I have this map, and it was just like, you know, and, it, and these concepts of, you know, blessing in terms of using water in a, a more effective way. And I was just like, okay, well. In a sense, why not? You know, if they're calling out on God for help because their crops are not prospering or they're calling out on God for help because they're in a drought or. Well, someone's got to answer their prayer. God could send an angel. He can send us. He could give them inspiration in a dream. And I think all those things are all practical. You know, someone could have a prophetic word. You know, it's unlikely sure. if they don't have that type of concept but who knows you know so i think there is there is a lot more to these things that we can engage what i don't think is that you know there's a few disney parks in heaven that you can just go to and you know because it because it's the concept that gets unveiled and gets developed you know i don't think every roller coaster plan is probably come out of heaven but the idea for those things and yeah. certainly the technical ability to to understand g-force and you know I mean, who first thought of doing a, a loop the loop mm -hmm. you know in a, in a roller coaster because it would be like you know woo because no, most of the older ones didn't do any of that oh, no. they, you know the big wooden ones and you know they were up and down and a few bends but they weren't any loop the loops or spirals or corkscrews yeah, so you have the whole concept of the steel coaster and the way that the wheels yeah. got run on the rail, which is totally different and way better than a wooden roller coaster. Okay. Yeah, you couldn't do a loop to loop on a, on an old wooden coaster; you'd be dead. So some of so some of that, yeah, I think there is inspiration that comes. Um, I think we have to engage with it, so mm -hmm. that it's not that we get a fully always just a fully formed idea. But I mean, I, I remember re, I think it was in a one of bill johnson books i think but he was talking about things of heaven invading earth and he was talking about uh, a guy who had a heart for worship and and really felt called into a worship type ministry but didn't have the wherewithal was 
had a dream and was given in this dream a total plan for a a bow like a bow and arrow bow and it was a one piece compact compound bow to, never been never been invented before he he didn't have any concept of he wasn't an archer but he had this plan so he was able to draw it or make it out and he sold it he sold the concept to somebody for for the money that needed to finance what he was called to do in his life yeah well that came as a as a dream well it came out of heaven no one had ever invented that before and he had never he wasn't an inventor but he was creative and he was able to engage and as a result god did that you know it, it, it's it is a interesting thing to look at how god relates to individual people and in which way and that is very different for different people you know, well, we, and that's have, we, why, yeah. we have a friend here locally and he's very much an entrepreneur um he's also in he's also an excellent musician and worshiper but he's but work-wise he's he's an entrepreneur and he got a dream several years ago for a game and it's a game that relates to how do you elect our president okay. and he spent 10 days 10 full days after I had the dream mapping it all out and working through all the dynamics of the game and it's now to the point where he's got like a functioning prototype uh he's got people doing it and he's just recently been put in contact with two two with the with the sons of a of a friend friend who are in that industry who potentially are going to be able to help him to know how to market it to bring it you know how to bring it to market now you know, i mean he he always likes to play games but the idea of of inventing one himself i don't know that it ever really crossed his mind he is very interested in politics but he said it was this dream that he got and he knew it was from the lord but it took him he spent like 10 days you know really roughing he got on it and worked it worked it worked it well now it's finally coming into that stage where um it's potentially going to be able to be marketed but you wow. know that that could cause some family arguments couldn't it hey eh? <laughs> doing a game of electing the president whoa well second guess all the things that you have to do all the oh. all the things behind the scenes uh, and a couple a friend of mine has played it and he said it takes you a little while to get the gist of it but he said once you get into it in terms of all the things that that are necessary and that will affect the outcome of the game he said yeah. it's really a fascinating thing to play yeah pay, paying off all those who might come out of the closet you know how do you lock the closet door so they can't yeah. come out yeah. <laughs> As one former president was accused of just getting rid of people yeah. <laughs> conveniently. Yeah, I, I now I'm not sure. I've not played the game, so I don't know how that is. I don't know if it's more what does it take to build alliances type of thing. I've not had a chance to play the game. But yeah, I mean that I hope he worked that into it because that's that's a real aspect of dealing yeah, well, with part of things, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, definitely. But I mean there was a case of where he got a dream, he really believed it was from the yeah. Lord. And so he's acted on it. Yeah, and to be honest, it's like most people wouldn't, you see. And I think that's the key. Is God giving opportunities to people all the time, but they're not tuning into them or they're not acting on them? You know, and I think, uh, I think you know, from what I've talked to people is that, that God gives Christians things all the time, but Christians are very laxed in act, and then someone else picks it up. You know, right. but I mean, I used to I used to spend time deliberately just daydreaming, mm -hmm. just just sitting, not thinking about anything or trying to, but just gazing out the window and just allowing the spirit to operate within me. And I found revelation truth came through that. The sure. ideas came, the insight came just because I gave the space for the creative process you know and now now i know how to do that in heaven i go to the throne of grace and i just lay there on the god's lap yeah heart feeling his heartbeat and he actually gives me 
things that I don't even have to come up with. You know, it's like I come with, hey, like, let's say, okay, this year, you know, six conferences, you know, that we're, do, we're doing this year. Okay, what, what are they going to be called? What are we going to do in them? What is each conference going to have in it? You know, and I'll go and I'll go to the throne of grace and I'll engage the father and I'll share my heart and just, hey, hey, Kay, you want me to do this? What do you want in it? And then I come out of that and I write it out. I write out the titles. I write out the session titles. I then go to each session and I write out the, the draft of what's going to be in each session. Just totally creatively without having to try and figure it out or come up with something. It's a creative inspiration that comes when I rest in his presence. There you go. And allow him to impart that revelation. That's right. And I just then don't try and figure it out. I just start writing it out. Yeah. And it's just like, okay, well, here's the next 15 sessions. Okay. And then I'm like, oh, well, there are 15 good titles. What's going to be in them? You know? <laughs> and, and sometimes I do that and I just get on my computer and I open a PowerPoint and I start. Put the title mm -hmm. in and just start. Mm -hmm. Just start typing you know, just, and then start to connect with, oh yeah. And oh yeah. And oh, oh yeah. You know, and if, and I mean, I could be looking at a, a session and I could go on creating in it until the last second of actually delivering it. You know, I mean, cause I do is that, and I, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, I, and I think, wow, <laughs> the more I look at it, the more creative it becomes, you know, the more I see, you know, and so sometimes you've got to deliver. I've got to say, no, I'm not going to do any more on this because I've got to give it, you know, uh, right, but right. usually on Saturday evenings when I'm at home and, you know, my wife, you know, she likes watching pretty much sort of drivel on the TV. <laughs> uh, Saturday evenings, you know, X Factor or whatever it is, you know, and I'm there. So I mean, so I just start looking at the stuff I'm going to be talking about the next morning. You know, and I start, you know, and then I get up on the Sunday morning and I engage and I, and I look at it again. And, you know, sometimes as much as 25% of what I do and say comes out of the last two times I look at something, you know, because I make the creative process one. So I'm not looking at this is what I'm going to say. It's looking at how, how can I say this? You know, how is this going to be released? And things come right to the last second sometimes, you know, and there are times I've been, I sat, we're sat down to do something. And at that point, God said, I want you to do something else. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Then <laughs> it's just like, you know, but it is all part of the relational process of that, allowing that creativity in the way that we're created in the image of God mm -hmm. um, to be inspiring for us and not, to be limited by the restrictions that well, I can't do that. That's impossible. That's not me. You know, I, I'm, I'm not learned enough. I, you know, I didn't under, you know, and we can just talk ourselves out of mm -hmm. things that God wants to put us into because of our own insecurities and lack of identity right. rather than, Hey, if God's calling me to do something, I'll be able to do it. I don't know how to be able to do it, but I don't know that. Need to know how. I just need to trust that I will when I get. I need to do it, you know, because I believe fully that I'll have all that I need to do everything I call to do whenever I'm called to do it, you know. And that's how I live. That's my expectation. So that's how I live. Someone else who lives from a thing, oh, I just don't know how to do this, and I'm not confident enough, and I'm not. They struggle, you know. Now they're probably no less creative than me, and some of them are a lot smarter than I am. They just don't believe. They don't right. believe what God believes about them. Sure. And it's that's that is so important in what we're doing in everything is, do I agree with God about me right. and about what he's called me to do in my destiny? So and going back, you know, so going back to it. James's original question yeah. Yeah. in terms of... I think it was something about, you know, someone having to experience joy in heaven. Yeah. So going back to that original question, if you're talking about the person who is timid, you know, doesn't have the confidence, meaning 
stepping into heaven, that same lack of confidence would potentially still be there and would be something that would have to be worked through. Yes? I believe so. Uh, because when I go and present myself as a living sacrifice, I'm expecting him to unveil anything he wants to deal with, whether it be a mindset, belief system, whether it be a, an attitude of behavior, a genetic issue. I'm saying, okay, you're the high priest, prepare me. Uh, therefore, I'm, I, not, I don't go into that realm thinking I'm perfect. You know, I'm going into that realm saying, whatever I need to do today, if there's anything that's going to hinder me doing it, deal with it. Show me if you want me to deal with it in any way. You know, so I'm open to that process of going through because it's a maturing process. You know, just because you step into heaven, you're not you're not necessarily mature. Yes. You know, it's yeah. like you go through a journey of experiencing, engaging, engaging God, Him unveiling things. You practice, you do them, you become more mature. It isn't an instant thing. And I know, I know, I've heard people say. Well, when you step into heaven, you don't have you don't have to take anything with you. Well, that would be great, but I don't think it's true. Because, but you can help in the process of stepping through that realm if you understand what the veil of his flesh is. So basically, when we step into that realm, it's a place of exchanging through the cross. So that's our access. So you can think well. What has the cross accomplished for me? And when I step into this realm, I'm embracing it because I'm going through the cross. Therefore, I can see new for old and sickness for health and, you know, righteousness for sin. And all the things that is there as part of what Jesus has done. But if I don't consciously embrace them, they're not automatic. Because it's about my mind. It's how I think. Just because I step into heaven doesn't mean I think totally like god you know i step into heaven and i have experiences which change my thinking so if you're struggling with depression to find joy it isn't going to be an instant fix without working through why you're depressed in the first place because mm -hmm. that's the issue why you can't receive joy because you feel heavy oppressed depressed why? Because you're probably your thinking and your emotions are completely out of sync with the truth of God. So my mind needs to be restored to the truth so that then everything will align up with the truth. But if I don't believe the truth, and most of that is about how I feel about myself and how I feel maybe God and other people feel about me, then I'm not going to live in it. And it isn't an automatic thing, a quick fix. Oh, keep going into heaven and everything will be all right. Well, keep going into heaven and embracing the whole aspect of what it means to step into heaven and you will find that that will begin to transform you absolutely it is a transformatory thing but it's not an instantaneous thing it's not like let's push the heavenly joy button you know and all of a sudden we'll have the fullness of joy because where is the fullness of joy coming from let my joy be in you so your joy can be full so it comes from relationship and for some reason, if you don't feel worthy of a relationship or you feel guilty or condemned or feel that you can't get close to God, how are you going to have his joy in you so that your joy can be full if you don't get close enough to him? You know, so it's the being embraced in the arms of God that imparts something that can begin to change how we feel and think. Not, I'm going to give you a lobotomy and, and cut all those things out, you know, because for me, that just didn't how it worked. You know, if, if it does work for some people like that, awesome. But I don't think that's a, that's a realistic thing for everybody. I think there does need to be a process. We had a conversation just, a, I think, a few meetings ago, I think, uh, where you spoke of someone who encountered someone in heaven who had come through uh, the consuming fire, but were guilt ridden because of their past life and didn't think that they deserved to be there. Do you remember that? Us talking about that? Yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah. another thing that, 
Another thing that I find uh, as I engage God in prayer, uh, let's say um, living conditions, and he doesn't talk about living conditions, but he talks about something in my mind not related to living conditions. Hmm. It seems that he's dealing with those issues that I need to bring before him, even though I'm not aware of it. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, often uh, when we, at least myself in the past, which has really been a huge hindrance, uh, trivialize the experience, trivialize the dream, uh, consequently uh, not giving it the attention and uh, the response that it really merits. Mm. So those yeah. as well have been hindrances. Mm. I mean, what I find is if we're proactive in the way in which we engage, then we get more out of the engagement. And if we're mm -hmm. just wandering through it, not knowing what's going on and floating through these things. So when I step into the realm of heaven, I consciously step through the veil mm -hmm. and consciously look at, is there anything that needs to be exchanged here? You know, and then I present myself as a living sacrifice. You know, it's an attitude of heart, which has become a constant thing now. But I used to, every day I would say, hey, I want to present myself to you, my high priest, as a living sacrifice. Do whatever you need to do to enable me to fulfill whatever it is I'm called to do today. Search my heart, oh God. You know, we can we can be proactive about it. Right. Yes. You know, and we can be surrendered to the process. But the way he then now works it is his business. What mm -hmm. we can't do is try and help him out. You know, I can remember God saying to me, you know, I don't require your assistance, just your surrender. You know, it was just like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll let you get on with it then. You know, yeah, there's a degree, sometimes a cooperation. Yeah. But there's, if our heart is set towards yieldedness, surrender, being a living, and I used to say to God mm. every day, I don't want my, I don't want a free will today. I don't want the free will to decide to do something independently of you. I surrender it. Take it. I want your will. Mm -hmm. I want a relationship where we're one spirit and I know your will, not my will. You know, and I used to say that every day. Now that's the way I live because that's my this complete attitude of my life. Not your will. You know, not my will, but yours be done. I don't want I don't want to make decisions independently. You know, so because I know what it does, you know, it doesn't get you too far generally, you know, but then when you're joined to the Lord and one spirit with him, you start making choices and doing things in relationship. And you don't know, did God inspire me to do that? Did my spirit inspire me to do that? Where did that come from? Because it's in relationship and you don't sometimes you don't even know. It's just part of the relationship that all that I need it's going to be unveiled and revealed and engaged in my relationship with God. You know, but most people don't go through the process enough for it to become a lifestyle. They want the instant fix. And you don't develop a lifestyle or a mindset or a belief system without going through it over and over again. You know, you don't develop the memory of how to walk a particular path without walking that path over and over again. But when you then have that as part of your, you don't have to think about it anymore. You know, and that's when you know it's part of your complete being that you don't consciously have to think, how do I do that? Where do I go for that? You just go, you be, you there, you know, and it's like, you know, I don't need to think about before I leave work and drive home, how to get home. I don't have to take the map out. I don't have to put the sat GPS thing on. I just drive. I'm not even thinking about turning left, turning right, turning left, turning right, turning right. You know, I don't think that. I don't plan it out because it is just completely part of where I live. It's part of my identity living there. So it's just instinctively obvious. But when I go somewhere else that I've got no idea where I'm going, you have to get a guide. You know, otherwise, how are you going to know where to go? Now, God can be that guide. He can guide you or he, or he can lead you and, and help you to see. And 
and then you walk together a little while and then you can begin to walk on your own and this is how jesus discipled people let me show you just watch how i'm doing this let's walk together you know and then one day it was like now out you go go in pairs and go out and do all the things and the holy spirit is with you and you're empowered but now you can go and do this now was he still with them mm-hmm. yeah he was with them with the spirit because the spirit was with them you know so it, it's it's not instantaneous yes if you get a download or a programming of something that's awesome but you still got to work it out you know just because you know something doesn't mean you live according to it yeah so it's when we walk it out and it becomes part of our lifestyle day after day after day i don't have to walk any pathways in heaven Mm -hmm. i just have to think and i'm there yeah because because those pathways are already completely formed within me that my mind can take me there now because they're stored with the uh, neural pathways connected to those places spiritually and i just have to think and i'm there but it wasn't always like that now most people want to get to that without having walked the path over and over again because we're sold the shortcut illusion hey you can get this without too much effort you know and it's not striving effort it's just repetition actually doing this until it becomes the way you live you know and i found that what i practiced and practiced and practiced for four or five years now i can do without having to think about it too much no you know i don't even i don't ask ask directions about how to get somewhere i just go you know and it's the same in all anything in life you know when you're making your favorite recipe you know you may get the book out or what you've written and whatever and you may follow it but probably when you've done it you know my mum has got you know she made some stuff i really like she doesn't get a recipe out she she knows how to make it she knows instinctively how much flour to put in and how many how much fruit to put in or whatever you know i like fruit cakes and stuff so you know, so ooh. Ooh, yeah oh yeah i like fruit cake <laughs> yeah so she knows and i think it's the same with us you know the more we do something the more it becomes part of who we are and the more it flows instinctively as we as we live it out but we got to get to that point right so and repetition think, repetition is a part of our transformation is that what we're saying or, or yeah yeah it is because what you do is you allow something new to replace something old mm-hmm. if you try and get rid of something old then you're focusing on what you're trying to get rid of and it's very hard to get rid of it but if you yeah. focus on something new the new replaces the old mm-hmm. you know and i think that's that's you know for me the more I've walked in heaven, the more I want to walk in heaven, the more I want to engage in heaven, because now it's something that is part of me and my life. Therefore, I'm walking in heaven all the time. I'm doing things in heaven all the time. Whereas when I started, I was stepping into it and stepping out and trying to take what I found in and bring it out and all those things. But now you live in there and you live here and you flow from one to the other all the time, you know, because then it becomes something that you're connected to, not something that you do. You know, I am a heavenly being. I was created in the heart of God. You know, I was birthed into that realm before I came into this realm. You know, before I became a living being, I was a spirit being. You know, and then we all became human beings. You know, and then we want to get back to being a living being and a spirit being and being whole and being one. Yeah. So it does take a degree of relationally walking it out you know and that's the key it's relational you know i don't go and demand god gives me a download i go and sit on his lap and rest you know yeah. and trust that i have grace and mercy in time of need my time of need maybe i'm speaking what am i going to speak about it may be all sorts of different things you know well what are we going to do about this situation yeah, you know, but it but it comes when I'm resting, not striving to analyze and find a solution through my own understanding, but are receiving a solution in relationship with him, which becomes my understanding because it came from him. And then, you know, things change. And, 
you know, and sometimes I just sit there and think, my word, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, <laughs> okay, God, I'm seeking first your kingdom. So you promise I'm going to have everything I need. So I'm just going to rest here and do what you need to do, you know? And sometimes we'll have a conversation and sometimes I'll share something. And sometimes it's just like, I just, and I find the revelation or the insight or whatever I need comes, you know, you know, without me having to strive to try and create it or make it or do it. Yes, you have to outwork it, but it can come in a relational revelatory way when we learn to sit and rest. You know, and even when dealing with depression and things like that, resting in the arms of God's love is a really good place to be. You know, because sometimes he can just say, hey, let, let me keep you here for a while. You know, All right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Let me impart to you, you know, because you're not going to get it. Where else are you going to get it? You know, because if he is love, joy, and peace, you know, you know, that is the very char essence of his character. The first three, a fruit of the spirit, love, joy, and peace. Those are the three things that Jesus talked about the most, you know, as I've loved you, so love others, receive my love, you know, my joy is going to be in you so your joy can be full. It's not like, oh, I'll go out and get a whole load of joy. No, spend time with me and my joy will be in you because you'll find joy in my relationship with you. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Let my peace remain with you. Mm -hmm. I give you peace which is beyond understanding, not as the world gives peace. Mm -hmm. So every all the solution comes out of the relationship of engaging who he really is. Right. You know, that's that's the solution to the problems. It's, it's in relationship with in, in him. And then it's letting go of the things that we're trying to figure out, work out, the fears, the worry, the anxiety. Do I trust you because I'm in your arms of love? Do I trust you? Yeah. No? That was so That's much a part of my presentation. Um, I talked about in John 6 when the disciples, other disciples left. Christ because of him talking about eating his body and drinking his blood. And he asked the, his disciples, will you go away also? And Peter said, well, to whom will we go? And I talked about, you know, when you get to those doubting moments and those questioning moments as to whether God is good or not, you don't solve your problem by leaving God. <laughs> you leave God, where are you going to go? <laughs> That's all it's saying. Well, well, that's it, you know, well, where are we going to go? You've got the words of eternal life. So where, where are we going? We're nowhere. You know, we recognize that enough. But, but even in the story, I mean, it's very interesting when you read the life of the disciples and the story, particularly Peter, because he's mentioned a lot. You find he went back to fishing a, a number of times. He did. He did. You know, and it was a sense of, because he didn't actually have the intimacy of relationship with Jesus. But when he did, then the revelation was being released through him. And, you know, yes, okay, he denied Jesus. But again, it, what it did was unveil well, what fear was still in him, That's what right. was still operating in him, to bring transformation into that situation, okay. not to condemn him. Jesus didn't condemn wow. him. You know, the challenge was there. That fear is what enabled the enemy to have the legal right to do that to him in the first place. You know, that's where it comes from. You know, what you fear can come upon you. Oh. So, you know, sometimes we think of Peter as being this big, strong, blustery character. He really wasn't. He had a lot of self-doubt. You know, that's why Jesus said to him, you know, I'm changing your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? You know, so I'm changing your identity because actually you're never going to get the job done with this identity. So here's a new name. You know, you're going to be solid. You're going to be secure. You're going to be firm. And even then, read the New Testament in Acts. He still was challenged to by the Judaizers and fear. So he still, you know, Paul had to challenge him face to face. Hey. You know, you had no problem eating with the Gentiles until this lot came around, and now look at you. Right. You're yeah. compromising. Yeah. You know, so it's an ongoing process. 
He'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He spent three and a half years with Jesus. You know, he'd gone through the whole thing. He preached to a, see 3,000 people respond and, you know, all that amazing stuff. And yet, yeah. he was still had issues. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it, it, it shows an ongoing relational transformation that needs to take place, not an instant fix. Mm -hmm. And if you think Jesus could have fixed anything, he didn't fix them. No. You know, he didn't fix them that suddenly they had no issues anymore. Because that would be unrealistic and uh, unrelate non-relational. Right. You know, he wants relationship and it's through the relationship. You know, me being a living sacrifice allows him to be my high priest in that relational way. Mm -hmm. Then he can prepare me. Yeah. I don't have to prepare myself or try and figure it all out. I surrender. I yield. I allow him to be him so he can enable me to be me. It is a relational process. You know, transformation cannot be automatic because automatic transformation would be non-relational. Non-relational. Yeah. yeah. And everything about God is walking it out with us relationally. Mm -hmm. Getting to know him, getting to know us. I can't know myself apart from knowing him. All I'm going to know is that which has come through the world system. I'm not going to know that which comes from his heart unless I engage his heart. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's an awful lot of stuff which we obviously receive from the outside in that needs to be changed by what we receive from the inside out. Well, it's only going to flow from the inside out if we engage God intimately to enable that to flow. You know, a lot of what we have done is create external systems to try and help people. Mm -hmm. And we sort of ask the Holy Spirit to help us, but we actually leave God out of the process mostly, you know, rather than he is central to everything of transformation that we need, everything of healing and wholeness and joy and peace. It's centrally him, not a process or a methodology, which is why I like some of the newer ways of engaging people ministry wise is that, well, what's God saying to you? You know, let's ask God to show you what he wants to deal with, whether it be lie busting or let's go to the court and let's let you hear for yourself. Yeah. You know, not, well, I, I know I can hear for you and I'm going to tell you what God says and what you can do, which was a lot of what the old ministry was. You know, but what God is saying is the old ways are more about the person delivering the ministry than the minister, person being ministered to. Whereas the new ways are more about God being involved in the process and the person facilitating, helping that person engage God. So that the next time they may not need to come back for wow. more ministry. They've got a relationship where they can ask God themselves. So. You know, when we first started taking on lie busting and, in, and people were learning within, within one or two sessions of the training, people were lie busting themselves all the time. They didn't need someone else to do it because they picked up the idea. I can ask Jesus if he wants to deal with anything at the minute. Do mm -hmm. I have any lies that I'm believing? Anyone you think you want to show me? Yeah. What about this one? Mm -hmm. you know, they didn't have to even have someone help them through the process when they have yeah. that process as part of them, you know, and it, it's, that's the way I think everything God wants is relational, you know, yes. not formulaic, not through some new system, but something which is going to be relationally unveiled and delivered. Yes, there can be a way of looking at it. Hey, there's a way of working yourself through the lie busting thing, but actually it's all done in the relationship rather than by the person ministering. They just ask the questions. And if you can ask yourself the questions, you can, you can take yourself through the process. You know, same with a court case. You know, I don't need to go into court with somebody else. You know, I can go and, stand there and call for the accusers and you know or even sometimes say okay god is there anything that i need to deal with in a court let him even bring it up you know i'm a living sacrifice so hey there may be some issue here that you want to deal with show me what it is i can go and find out what the accusations are i can own it and connect to it and be transformed by it and i think that's uh, it's so important that we don't formularize any thing that we're learning how to do that takes the relationship out of it 
otherwise we'll we'll be back into a religious system it's just we have new religious things that we do rather than relational things that we do you know and that it is so important because it, it is you know it's like the court system some people are taking it as well this is a new way of praying you know they don't really it isn't a relational process they this is how you pray now so i'm going to I'm going to pray to God this way rather than the way I used to do it. So mm -hmm. spiritual warfare. Well, we used to do it this way. Well, now we're doing it this way, you know, and, and we can leave God out of it if we're not careful because it's the default of the DIY path. You know, mm -hmm. that's the default that we go to when we're not walking with, with the God, with God in the fire, in the garden, you know, in, in our life, walking relationally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what is the status of your book? The status of the book is I should be getting a box of books delivered on Friday, and then they should, it should be publicly released at the end of September, the 28th of September, I think. Wow. So, awesome. Yes, yes, yes. All, all written, all done, um, is being printed, and it will be available, yeah, to buy through Amazon, I guess. Yeah. Are you, doing, are you doing a kindle version also or yeah just there will be a kindle version yeah okay they're just they're just <laughs> sorting that one out, they're sorting that one out. Uh, the fir their first effort of getting a kindle version wasn't too good you know whatever oh. they sort of the, we read it and think no this doesn't look right you know, so, <laughs> yeah. so yeah by the time by the time it's launched hopefully that whole version will be done and um yeah it should go should go on sale so yeah i love a a few books here for the next conference that we do for people who are actually here physically. Um, but when is the next one? The next one is the uh, 20th of September. Okay, no, sorry. Yeah. No, the 20th of September, which is on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. Cause I know that Joe said that the la for the last one, we had somewhat, somewhat of a glitch. And so he was waiting, he had to work with someone in the office to get something straightened okay. out because we're going to definitely be taking that my other question is what have you decided to do about your sunday service since you were questioning why are we doing what we're doing have you made any changes um yeah we're, we're in process of looking at how we can establish a fresh foundational way of doing it um relationally um yeah uh, and i think that means that it needs to come out of the working together with people to engage God around that rather than one or two people saying, oh, yeah, this is what we can do. And so the, the process needs to be in place and, and different, some different people need to be part of that process to add a different flavor to some of it. And some of it is, you know, god wants me to get out of the way you know and i you know i was engaging the other heaven the other day and i this song came into my mind and it was this really really old song and and it was a, a graham kendrick song on march for jesus type stuff and it was make way you know make way and i kept hearing this song and it's like yeah you need to make way so I'm like, okay i need to get out of the way and so some things yeah i think we're in a process where um you 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 don't have a manual to follow <laughs> or, you know, or anyone else's particular even help, you know, when you start with no, knowing nothing and you try and figure out how to do something or work it out. So you go through various stages, I think, of um, growth and you get to the point and like, I think for us, we got to the point, it's like, is this a prototype that we could actually see replicated? And it was like, no, I don't think we want to replicate this, you know? So do we know and have learned way more than we knew five years ago? Yeah. Has that changed how, what it looks like? Not necessarily. So how can it change what it looks like? How can it be actually more relationally foundational than we have right now? So yeah, I think we'll we'll look to see how how what we would have done if we knew what we knew now. How can we do that now? So you know, 
it's not easy, but it may require a different foundation um, and a more relational foundation than we were able to put in you know, six, six years ago. So that before we go any further, it's actually making sure that the foundation and the people who are involved in that foundation um, are, are going to have the, let me think, is, how do I say it? It's is more to have the freedom to be able to express what that foundation is without the pressure of having to manage a big organization of various parts, you know, uh, and we, the people who were are the foundation now are capable of managing a lot more but that isn't sustainable if the next people who come in don't have the same level of skills you know so we wanted to make sure that it's not based on so much what you know but who you know and how you work that out in a relational way with god so yeah we're in a place of i think looking to see you know how that was and it's almost like you know the foundations of the kahal the, the house of god whatever you wanted to call it was 10 people you know and without those 10 people you didn't have the foundation well we started with 10 people and we've had that you know develop but actually those 10 people don't know what we know now and this we have different people and there may well need to be more different people who are involved in the process. So we're in that place. It's all the, you know, those who don't like change struggle and those who like change think, hey, here's an opportunity <laughs> you know, to, to do things. You know, it's like, you know, when you get to a prototype stage, you have to review, don't you? Oh you know, God. if we're going to be a storehouse for a harvest, we want to be a reflection of what that will be. And you have to review, is this it? And, I, and I've and i you know been feeling for a while, now this isn't really it. We know a lot, we have insight, we can do a lot of things we couldn't do before, but actually is this really, you know, I don't think it is. So we have to review, well, okay, well, how can we then shape that to form a better foundation for what it is, you know, and that's where we'll be. And I, you know, and I know God's calling me to step out of it, so, you know, I've got a period of time where I can be involved in helping and then God wants me to step out of the way and make way, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, that will be interesting over the next 12 months to see how that develops. But mm -hmm. yeah, it, I think we are Sundays and different things. Yeah. Are slightly different because I think when God starts to challenge things, people then feel, Oh, I, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, you know, and for us, particularly that's with our musicians, they're like, well, we know it's not really this and we know it's not really that, but what really is it? And do I really want to do it? So you end up sort of something which was something which we relied on becoming something which now you can't rely on. So what do you do when there's no music or what do you do when this or what? Well, you engage God and you ask him what to do. So then you have a lot more flexibility on what you can do or what you might want to do. And I've also stepped back from the teachings because I'm not teaching anything here, you know, like I was. I'm still teaching, but I'm, I'm just teaching the Engaging God program to produce the sessions. I'm not doing it in the same way as I was. So people can't rely on me. So what are we going to do this Sunday? Well, don't ask me because I know what I'm going to be doing, but... What are you going to be doing? You know, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so I've stepped out of a lot of it, but people are stepping into that and more people are sharing and people are, it's being done in a different, and it's being yeah, probably more therapeutic and looking to help activate things in people to help transform people. And I think the last few weeks we've done father heart issues and mother heart issues and different things, which are trying to get at a deeper level so that people can actually meet god in a different way and experience him and you know that's where we are um and i'm sure you know when those who feel called to engage god at that level begin to engage him then he will give them some revelation about what to do and what not to do because i'm not going to say because i'm not going to be the one who is you know giving the answers to this god has to give the answers 
you know so we'll see it's interesting and i think you know it's an opportunity um i always see things as an opportunity <laughs> you know i don't see things as an obligation oh no we've got to do this it's like here's an opportunity now here's an opportunity for me to get out of the way and let other people are able to release what they're going to receive from God into this situation. So, you know, yeah. my, my, I, I know what I'm called to do in the next period of time. And, uh, and then, you know, in that more people have to be involved by engaging God and outworking that themselves. Yeah. You know, otherwise, you know, I know what it will be like, you know, um, if, if it, if it's if people are looking to me for to validate what they're doing then they're not going to be free to be themselves and therefore you know i'm not looking to validate what they're doing so yeah i will probably have a less of a role in some of it but a different role in supporting it i guess perhaps for a period of time but we'll see you know and everyone you know god starts to take everyone through the process in their own lives then yeah. You know, because at the end of the day, how are we going to fulfill our destiny if individuals aren't fulfilling their destiny? There is no corporate destiny that's separated from individuals because it's people. You know, whatever it is, the Ecclesia, Embassy of Heaven, City of Refuge, it's people. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual organism um, which has to function relationally and not formulaically. It's just, well, how does that work? You know, and I'm sure God will give people more confidence and he'll speak to them more clearly, you know, when they're when they have to hear him because no one else is going to hear him for them. <laughs> you know, yeah. You're a little bit, you know, it's like, you know, because I'm not, you know, I'm not going to hear for people. I'm going to help them here. And that's a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm ready for that. You know, I'm sort of, you know, I'm sort of, hey, you know, in my spirit, God's already prepared me for shifting into other things so you know i'm 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 okay with that but we'll see it'll be fun <laughs> well it's be fun for me i'm not sure it'll be fun for anyone else but it'll be fun for me anyway. <laughs> but, yeah, that's good yeah but i think everybody has to to get to that point in their lives where they're willing to review and say god is this it it's like surely this isn't it you know <laughs> that would be my thing is surely there's got to be more than this and i think right. there is and no matter where you are there's still a journey and a process to go through and therefore the willingness to embrace that is key you know, whether it be individually in our own personal lives or anything we're involved in corporately you know it is it takes process and journey to do it you know and some people need to take some a, a rest break to review where are you where, where are you in the right place is this the right road you know but otherwise you can just be swept along yeah. with a lot of other things and not actually really understand or be there it's like it's easy to get swept along with everybody else you know but it's, it's it need it's, it needs time to say okay i'm going to reflect i'm going to engage god and I'm going to start to ask him to unveil some deeper things, you know, and to ask the questions, be proactive about asking the questions that you can give the answers to, you know, it's so much easier to ask and him answer than him trying to engineer a situation for us that makes us ask, you know, and that, that's what a lot of people do. They get between a rock and a hard place before they call out and ask God, you know, well, we can, we can ask him cause he's wanting to answer us. You know? then it's easier yeah you know, it is easier when you when you're proactive and pursue you know there you go. rather than him having to get us to the point where we're willing to ask yeah, yeah. 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 it all boils down to not trivializing our connection with god whether it's dreams or just through prayer and yeah. uh he really merits a supreme position in our awareness and we have to engage in us absolutely you know that we can't become who we are without beholding him there you, you know that's the only way we're going to become is to behold and we need to see the mirror that's reflected the image that's reflected in the mirror of his face 
you know, that's going to unveil either. I don't think I look like that, you know, or therefore what I'm going to change then because I'm not thinking I look like what God says I am, you know, and it sometimes has that effect. Well, are you being serious? You know, (laughs) yeah, I am. Why do you struggle with that? Ooh, well, you know, and, and it creates opportunity for change. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah this new home we're um, about to move into is very secluded. Um, neighbors, but not very close to us and things of that nature. Nice land around the house. Hmm. And we decided, uh, I think it was just yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. just yesterday, we decided so that uh, we weren't going to buy a television. The house doesn't come with a television, and we were not going to buy one and really uh, just do life quite differently. Of course, we have our computer, but we're not going to buy a television, and we're going to spend this. I look at it as an opportunity. God has given us an opportunity for seclusion, an opportunity to really engage him now. I mean, really engage him because yeah. we're in... An environment and in uh, a, mind, a mindset ourselves where we can really do this now in a yeah. much deeper, deeper way, and uh, it's exciting. Yeah, and I think there are lots of times on our journey where there has to be a review of lifestyle, and you know, to be able to do something. You know, if you were still back in Georgia, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. You know, no. you know. So you right. at times there's a shift that takes place of maybe where you live or how you live that facilitates things. That's why really a lot of the people on the Engaging God program are at an age where they can make those choices mm-hmm. and are not restricted. Mm-hmm. You know, because sometimes it's not easy to change the whole of things when you've got four kids running around in yourself yeah. homeschooling them and you're doing this. Mm-hmm. So at times, you know, God knows that. You know, mm-hmm. now yeah. sometimes, yeah like Abraham will get take everything and go well in reality he didn't have that much you know he took a little bit more than he should have took you know (laughs) yeah but he didn't have that much to take you know we didn't have any children did he so it wasn't like he was up uprooting the family I think there were probably some servants who went with him and things but you know but for some things are sometimes lifestyle challenges are big you know and we got to be in the right time and season to be able to do some of them yeah. but when you are then you you do find you know you can you can do things beyond what you would have been able to do before and i think that's why you know those that are of a certain age let's say you know are more able to mentor others because they have a the life experience of their own testimony with god as well but also the time yeah. and the willingness to use that time invest in other people Whereas most people spend most of the early part of their life investing in themselves. So they're investing in their education and then they're investing in using that education and then they're investing in creating whatever they need to do, whether it be family and home and all that stuff. And generally it is more centered around themselves. Well, you get to a point where it becomes more centered around others, you know, and that's when things can change. I think a lot. Very good. Excellent. Okay, right, I'm going to leave it there. Nice to...